All right, so we're going to be opening from the book of Colossians. We're going to be reading from chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. And from this text, we're going to find the title and theme of my message. Again, we're going to be reading from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. Uh, and if you don't have nothing to take notes, you can look at the screen as we read it together. But before I open up in this passage of scripture, I first want to give us some context that in this particular passage, Paul is calling the Colossian believers to reflect Christ, to reflect Christ's character in every area of their lives, specifically within their relationships with one another. Again, Paul is challenging the people of God to reflect the character of God, but specifically in the context of relationships. How many know that if we're going to be a church that looks, lives, and leads like heaven, which means we are a multi-ethnic, multi-generation, multi-dimensional church, we're going to have to know how to do relationships well. Can I get an amen? Because it's in relationships God brings blessings into your life, but it's also in relationships Satan wants to bring curses in your life. And if we don't know how to do relationships God's way, we will miss out on the blessings that God has for us out of fear, out of hurt, and we will hide ourselves from the benefit of being in relationships. But it, 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 let me say it this way. You might have been hurt by a relationship, but what if I told you that God is going to use a relationship to heal you? In the same way we were hurt, God will also bring healing through relationships. And we can't heal a broken world without a united church. We can't look to the world to teach the world how to be united. Because the world really doesn't know how to unite because the world typically unites around causes. But as people of God, we unite, we unite around Jesus. We unite, we, we unite around the kingdom of God. And when we have this type of unity under God, we know how to have differences. We know how to look different from each other. But unity, let me say it this way, unity is not the sameness of a purpose. Or let me say it this way, unity is not the sameness of a person. It's the oneness of a purpose. I'll say that again. Unity is not the sameness of a person. It's the oneness of a purpose. In order for us to unite around a purpose, we have got to learn. Can I say God? Can I speak a little bit uh, how I talk? Don't judge me, y'all. We, we, we're a church that's diverse, amen? We have to know how to be united and love one another. So it says right here, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience my god this is the part that hurts and it's hard sometimes make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you not someone anyone who offends you let me pause i'm gonna finish reading that the reason why we have to forgive we have to forgive anyone who offends us because if you are easily offended you are easily angered and if you are easily angered you are easily taken off your course to purpose and destiny that if, if God has a plan for your life if God has a plan which he does for your relationships if you are easily offended then the enemy can hijack your purpose and destiny because we can't fulfill what God wants us to do without relationships so it says right here Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, oh, here's the caveat. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe. This means that this is an action. Where it says clothe yourself with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, this means it's not a feeling, it's a choice. We don't have to feel our way to tenderhearted mercy. We don't have to feel our way to kindness. We don't have to feel our way to humility. We don't have to feel our way to gentleness. We choose to do these things. What if I told you your ability to choose is much more powerful than your ability to feel? Our ability to feel uh, shows us that we are human, but God gave us the ability to be free moral agents, which means we have a will. And we know we have a will because he doesn't make us love him. We choose to love him. And God is saying in the same way I love you, in other words, we need to love God first 
so that way we know how to love others. And if we don't know how to love God, we won't be able to choose tenderhearted mercy. We won't be able to choose kindness, gentleness, because you can't give what you haven't encountered yourself. You can't pour what you haven't been exposed to. And it says right here, clothe yourself with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Somebody say perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. The title of my message today is Perfect Harmony. Somebody tell their neighbor, say, Perfect Harmony. I'm going to pray real quick. Spirit of the living God, we thank you for being in this service today. God, I ask that you will speak through me, think through me, help me to articulate myself in such a way that every person can receive the word of God, that they will receive it on good grounds. I ask that you don't just give me eloquence, but effectiveness, that we will not just have a temporal impact on the hearts, but of eternal impact on everyone's heart in here. I rebuke the devourer. I come against every plan of the enemy and the adversary that try to steal the word. And I declare that your people are good grounds in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Somebody say perfect harmony. harmony. Now, I want to give you a definition of harmony. Uh, Harmony means the combination of sounds or instruments simultaneously working together to produce a pleasing effect. And one of the ways that we can better understand harmony is something that maybe we all have been exposed to, studied, been to, or know about, which is an orchestra, right? In an orchestra, there are a variety of different instruments, a variety of different sounds. And when you put all these sounds together, by themselves, they're very beautiful, but together they're very powerful. They offer a, a unique sound that is uncommon to the sound individually. And when I think about harmony, when I think about uh, different things coming together, it reminds me of the Bible. The Bible has a lot of harmony to it. Think about it this way. The Bible uh, is written in a span of 1,500 years. It has about 40 different authors. It's 66 different books. It's it's written in three different languages, Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek. And it's written from three different continents, Africa, Europe, and Asia. and, And it's funny because you have all these different parts of the Bible, yet it all flows to communicate one sound, and that's Jesus Christ. How is it that it can have 40 different authors be written in three different languages from th- uh, three different continents, 60 t- 66 different books, written in a time, f- time span of 1,500 years. Some of these authors didn't know each other, but they're all speaking and sounding the same. It's because they have a divine orchestrator. It's because they are under something called the Holy Spirit which takes the unique sound of everything, everybody, and brings us all together to make one sound. And God can take the noise of your life, the noise of your past, the noise of your hurt, the noise of your pain, the sound of your cry, and if you can surrender that to God, God can grab you into his orchestra so that you can sound in unity like him. It's called the body of Christ. Amen. And it all flows in perfect harmony. Check this out. Not because the 40 different authors, the three different languages, written from three different continents, since the 66 books were written by perfect people, it's because it's led by a perfect God. Only a perfect God can take imperfect people to make a perfect sound. My God. Only a perfect God can take your imperfections Put it under the blood of Jesus and make you perfect in all your ways. 
Only a perfect God can take your imperfections, the past, the hurt, the trauma, and make something beautiful out of it. Only a perfect God can take your mess that you surrender to God and lay it at the feet of Jesus and make it your message. God can take your pain and make it your purpose. God can take whatever you've gone through, and if you will submit it to the divine orchestrator, he will allow you to be a part of something much bigger than you. By yourself, you may offer a sound, but when you are uh, united with other sounds, you give off a powerful sound. And the kingdom of God is not just of talk. It's not just of one person. The Bible says the kingdom of God is of power. That word power means the ability to get results. That, that, it means the ability to influence my circumstances. True power that comes from God will affect your circumstances in a kingdom way. True power from God, which is rooted in prayer, will change what's happening in your life so it can come in alignment with what God wants to happen in your life. And the Bible says that the righteousness, excuse me, the kingdom of God is of righteousness, it's of peace, and it's of joy in the Holy Ghost. And I believe the Lord wants a beautiful sound coming not from just this church, but the church. And that is a sound of unity. That is a sound of peace. That is a sound of love. And that is a sound of hope and faith. Somebody give God praise to that, for that. Now, I want to talk about what is peace. Because in order for us to do relationships well, we have to understand a few things about peace. Peace, somebody say peace. peace. Peace is not the absence of conflict. My God. Peace is in the midst of conflict. I know who my source is. And let me unpack it this way. Let me say it one more time. Peace is not the absence of conflict. You're not keeping the peace by avoiding the conflict. In fact, you're piling up conflict to where you ain't going to be able to handle it. You're just going to blow up one day. Peace is not the absence of conflict. Peace is in the midst of conflict. I know who my source is, and that is Jesus. And when you know who your source is, Jesus, you can show up in any relationship. You can show up in any conflict knowing you are fully resourced, fully loved, where you don't have to outsource your emotional stability or your validation to somebody liking you or somebody agreeing with you or somebody having to do what you want them to do. When we know peace is not necessarily a virtue, but it's a person, then we know that peace is a person that we have to spend time with so that we can have internal peace so we can see peace externally. Amen. Amen. So, so making peace is not always simple in relationships. It's not always easy. You know why? Because having peace sometimes requiring, requires dying to yourself. Dying to selfishness, self-absorb, dying to what you think is right always, dying to yourself. That's why the Bible says there's no greater love than someone who lays down their life for someone. And what it's talking about is Jesus. In order for God to have peace with humanity, he sacrificed his son Jesus. In other words, in order for us to sometimes have peace, we have to sacrifice our agenda for the sake of the relationship. Now, again, peace is not a person. Excuse me. Peace is not the absence of conflict. It is a person. Because when you have Jesus, you are your most authentic self. <laughs> not just authentic self. Because some of your authentic self is not your true self because your true self is the you that you died to yourself that you found in Christ. You don't find the real you doing you. You find the real you being submitted to God. So you don't find your most authentic self being you. You find your most authentic self spending time to the P Prince of Peace, spending time to the one that knows you before you were even born, that knows the number of uh, hairs that you have on your head. You find your most authentic self through Christ so you can be your most God authentic self my most authentic self in my 20s is totally different than my most authentic self in my 30s because when I thought I was my most authentic self in my 20s I realized that was a very unhealthy authentic self but as I began to spend time with God as I began to know who I was I began to find out who I was in my most God authentic self 
So now when relationships challenge me or when different conflicts arise, I'm not afraid of conflict. I can lean into conflict because conflict is not a bad thing if you know what it the purpose is. Conflict can be a good thing. So when I understand conflict and I understand who I am in God, then I can approach conflict very resourced, very loving, tender-hearted, gentle, not to try to get my way, but try to understand another person's way. The goal of conflict is not agreement. The goal of conflict is understanding. Because if the goal of conflict is agreement, there's always one person louder. There's always one person more aggressive. And whoever the most loudest or most aggressive person in the relationship will always win. And although you might have thought that, okay, we worked that out, but the other person is feeling like they're not heard because the other person is much louder and much more aggressive than the other person. So when you approach conflict as we need to agree versus we need to understand, and choose to believe or agree what we want to choose, then you will stop making demands out of fear and start making requests because you are loved. Now, our level of peace can be measured in how we handle those who mishandle us. I can tell if the Prince of Peace walks with you the moment your brokenness rub up against somebody else's brokenness. And now because they mishandle you, you want to hurt them. What if I told you hurting them still won't hurt? Let me say it this way. What if I told you hurting them still won't heal your wound? In fact, if you really believe that God is sufficient, if you really believe that God is bigger than your pain, if you really believe that God can heal your pain, then you won't start trying to be vindictive and revengeful in your pain. Because God is bigger than my pain. In other words, when I feel pain, when I feel hurt, I can trust that he is a healer. And I can trust that I don't have to place demands. I don't have to use fear. I don't have to react. I can respond. Not responding to get you to do what I want, but responding because I belong to somebody who has everything I need. So I can show up in my marriage, in my business, in my relationships. Even if you don't do what I want you to do, I can still love you unconditionally because you are not the source of my emotional stability you are not the source of my identity you are not the source of my validation Jesus is and if Jesus is my source then I can show up fully resourced and love you even when you are mishandling me my God my God so peace starts with God we won't fully experience relational peace in our relationships until we have etern internal peace with God. You won't fully receive peace in your relationships until you have peace in your relationship with God. See, when you don't have peace with God, you'll go to romance to mend things in your heart that your parents might have done. When you don't have the peace of God, you'll try to use romance to mend things that happened in your childhood. When you don't have the peace of God, you'll try to use relationships to heal you. But first, before relationships can heal you, you have to be aligned with the healer of relationships. And then once you put him first, then God will use people to be his tool to heal you. But you don't got the part with you and God first, so you're looking to humanity to do things that only divinity can do. You're looking to man to be the source when God is the source. So until I had peace with God, I couldn't have peace in my marriage. Until I had peace with God, I couldn't have peace in other relationships. It was only when I encountered the loving, all-powerful, all-knowing God. Because even though my wife is my everything, and when I say my everything, she is my everything. It is an it is a unhealthy way to expect her to do everything. My God, she didn't say amen, good wife. I thought she was going to be like, amen. <laughs> when I trust that God is my everything, even though situations, I need them to meet certain needs in my life, I put a demand on God when I say, God, you are my everything and you're going to use people to meet the needs that you want to meet. But it's more so keeping him at the focus of the relationship. Again, my wife is my everything, but she can't meet every, every need. Because she is human. 
Amen. God, there's things that only God can meet in my life. And when I have a healthy relationship with God, then I can start having a healthy relationship with my spouse, a healthy relationship with my kids, a healthy relationship in relationships. And when you have a relationship with God, you won't try to make your son your boyfriend, your daughter your girlfriend. Sometimes we, because we couldn't get what we needed in one relationship, we are turning our kids into a relationship that is unhealthy, unbalanced, and I need to make sure that God is right so that my kid can be a kid and I'm not looking for them to meet a need that the previous boyfriend, husband, wife didn't meet, and now I'm mad at them because I placed a weight on them that only God can meet. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> Holy Ghost, let's go, Rob. So meaningful relationships involves risk. Somebody say it takes risk. Relationships are going to be risk, calculated risk. And we all have taken risk before. And we've all been hurt and taken another risk after we've been hurt. But, but let me say it this way. It's in relationships we will experience hurt and healing. It's in relationships we will experience joy and pain. It's in relationships we will experience love and hate. Relationships are not neutral. They're either moving us forward or backwards. This is why how we do relationships is super critical and important. But the most important relationship that you and I have to continually cultivate so that our relationships on a horizontal level doesn't be outsourced to only what God can do on a vertical level. And relationships are too important. Oh, somebody needs to hear this. Relationships are too important to just manage them emotionally. Some relationships, you have to manage them intelligently. What do I mean by that? You can't take every bad day as someone having a bad heart. My gosh. Peter had a bad day. Judas had a bad heart. I can't put on Peter a Judas situation. In other words, if somebody had a bad day, I can't manage that emotionally to think they have a bad heart. What I have to understand is, according to Colossians 3 and 12, let me make allowance for someone who hurt me because someone who hurt me in one day can also be someone who can heal me in another day. But if I burn the bridge of somebody who had a bad day and made them think that they had a bad heart, I might be severing myself from provision because what if God placed some healing? What if God placed some provision in the relationships that you're cutting off? God might have put those relationships there to also bring wealth, health, and provisions in your life. This is why we can't be so quick to cut people off. This is why we can't be so quick to just uh, make somebody, just because they had a bad day, that they're no longer good people. Can I get an amen? And if we are going to be a church filled with the diversity, filled with people from the street to the Wall Street, filled with people that look different ethnically, that act differently, different in age, we have best be prepared how to make allowances for one another. Amen? Because the same grace that you got, you're going to have to extend. And the same grace that you want from somebody else, you're going to have to show that to someone else as well. So relationships, somebody said relationships. Relationships is how God advances his kingdom. It's what he uses when he wants to bless our life. And conflict, somebody say conflict. What if I told you conflict is the cost to deeper intimacy and better relationships? Conflict. Oh, I know, I know some of y'all don't like conflict. I know some of y'all don't like it, but I'm hoping and I'm praying that you will lean into conflict after this message and not see conflict as a cuss word, not see conflict as a bad thing. Again, conflict is the cost to deeper intimacy and better relationships. You won't have deeper intimacy and you won't have better relationships if you avoid conflict. In fact, that's why some of you guys think you better off on your own and you have learned how to be independent. Yeah, you might have in your independence been a good business person in your independence you might have achieved things but also in your independence you're relationally broke and where you've outsourced to what you can do on your own you can only go so far and God wants to expand your territory God wants to broaden your horizons but until you know how to lean into conflict you will be good by yourself but you won't be great because greatness requires other people my God 
Proverbs 27, 17 said, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. I've never seen iron go against iron without sparks flying. Sometimes sparks will fly in conflict, but that is okay because conflict is how we get a better understanding how to meet different people's needs. Proverbs 27, 6 says this. Oh, check this part out. My wife is good at this one. Faithful are the wounds of a spouse. <laughs> it says friend. Faithful are the wounds of a friend who corrects out of love and concern, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful because they serve his hidden agenda. That sounds like there's a reward in conflict. But are you positioning people into your life that tell you what you want to hear and all the people that can tell you what you need to hear have you have you set boundaries of them not being in your life so we got to make sure that we're setting uh boundaries for people who can speak into our life speak into our life and not just have people who we like what they say to us now i, I want some encouragement i want people to say good things to me but i also want the truth if i got a booger in my nose let me know don't be like, man, you, you look good today. I got a big old booger talking to somebody. If my breath stink, I want to know. Amen? If I'm missing it in a fashion sense, I, I, I need my guy missing it, let me know. Pastor D, you missing it on that one. <laughs> because conflict, correction, brings resources. Um... Let me say it this way. When we run from conflict, we may be running for provision. Let me say it better. When we run from conflict, we may be running from provision. Now, I want to talk about five ways healthy conflict can help you. Five ways how healthy conflict can help you. Do we have that? Five ways. Number one, conflict helps you evaluate yourself. Evaluate your part in it. It helps us to evaluate ourselves. Don't be telling somebody about themselves unless you can own your part about yourself. We got too many people pointing at what is in somebody else's eye and they got this big old beam in their eye. Amen? Evaluate yourself first. Don't tell me, don't tell nobody about themselves until you told yourself about yourself. Second thing, Five ways healthy conflict helps us is it helps us to reevaluate and reprioritize our relationships. You might have put somebody on a best friend level and they just need to be on an acquaintance. And conflict revealed that you accelerated the relationship too fast and you need to bring them back a couple levels because you had them on level five and they need to just be on level two. But check this out. Just because they are not supposed to be on level four don't, does not mean they shouldn't be in your life at all on any level. You just got to reprioritize them. You may not be a level five relationship, but you might be a level two. So it helps me prioritize the relationship. Number three, it helps us to grow deeper and stronger in our relationships. Every relationship that I have that's been over a decade or five years or, or in my marriage or whatever the case may be, we are strong and we are close because we had conflict that we shared. And conflict is simply just communicating when a need hasn't been met. But too often we are good at communicating when you miss the need that was met than communicating the need that needed to be met first. Did y'all hear me on that? So oftentimes we have a need that needs to be met. And instead of communicating, here are my needs, we, communicating, we communicate when the needs don't get met first. Don't wait till the needs don't get met. Communicate what the needs are so that the person who's called on whatever level in relationships can have a bullseye to know how to meet your needs and love you and not have to machine gun approach. We can't, we can't be like, you should just know me. You should just know by now what I like. No, I'm not a detective. I should know what's in your heart. You need to communicate what's in your heart. Don't place the responsibility of me knowing what's on your heart in your heart. You have to communicate what is in your heart and tell me what it is you need. Tell me what it is you're feeling so I can know how to meet that need if I so choose. Number four, it brings unrealistic expectations to reality. It brings unreal, you have this expectation and now conflict shows you, you thought they were, you, 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 uh, I'm over here, you, 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 man, dang, <laughs> let, me, let me slow down, I, I, I tried a new uh, 
What is it? Energy drink. And it got me hecka on fire right now. I might need to drink that at 7 and not at 8.50. <laughs> what was I saying? Number four. That's right. That's right. It brings unrealistic expectations to reality. That's right. You might have thought you were grooming a lover when they are better off as a friend. Come on. My gosh. I guess that's why God gave me that. You, 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 you. Because he's like, let me give you this download real quick. So you over here grooming a lover before you cultivate a friendship. And you mad because they're not calling you every day. You mad because you're not getting the compliments you want. You mad because they're not pursuing you or responding the way you want them to respond. Just keep your head down if I'm talking to you. You don't got to look around. <laughs> but the conflict of you not getting what you want helps you understand. I might have thought we were here, but I need to bring it back down here, okay? It is unfair to the person that you have all these expectations because you got this wild imagination and they have no clue what is in your imagination. And you got all this expectation. You want them to be this, that, and a, you already thinking wedding bells. You already thinking about your colors. You already thinking about what your kids going to look like. You like, oh, they about to be mixed. They're going to have green eyes. They're going to look this way. You didn't made your imagination make them here. And, and that ain't the reality of the relationship. They a friend. Amen? So number five, it helps us to set new boundaries. Why is this important? Because we should always be evaluating who's in our circles of trust. Some people need to be added to our circle. Some people need to be corrected in our circle. Some people need to be adjusted in our circle. Take a deep breath. And some people needs to be kicked out of our circle. You can clap on that one. So. <laughs> healthy conflict starts with you. The greatest conflict that any of us can pursue is with ourselves. Let me say that again. Healthy conflict starts with you. Guess what? We sometimes avoid us and go to other people because if we can point out the flaws and issues in other people, it helps us to overlook and not have to deal with us. If you could keep telling your spouse she's wrong in this area or he's wrong in that area. If you could keep telling your kids they don't need to do this and do that. If you can keep pointing the flaws of your relationships it allows you to be blinded in what you need to change and have conflict with yourself in your relationship with yourself. You can't be mad at your kids who have temptations and struggles that you ain't overcome, but you keep placing all these challenges. You keep bringing all this conflict. You don't need to act like that. You don't need to be doing this and you don't need to be doing that. You are putting conflict on them that you didn't even overcome yourself. And your kids see that hypocrisy. Why is mommy and daddy challenging me in this area when they are not even delivered and healed in that own area for themselves? So you have no right confronting anyone until you've confronted yourself. Matthew 7 says, and why worry about a speck in a friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, Lord, help me you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Scripture says, hypocrite, first get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Can I speak to the parents real quick? Because I am a parent of a 22-year-old, an 8-year-old, and a 4-year-old. Your, your, your Christians won't love Jesus if you are a hypocrite in your own home. They are not going to want the God that you're talking about. They're not going to want the God that you serve if you don't practice what you preach. It ain't about what you say. It ain't about what you tell them. It's what you model in your own life because you can't produce in your kids what you haven't produced in yourself. And the teenagers in the room say amen. Don't say too loud. You might get slapped. <laughs> you might get back in. <laughs> so the question is, what do we do when we give people access to our lives or our heart and they're not careful or become irresponsible with that access? My gosh. I'm going to ask that question again because that's a tough one for me. 
What do we do if we know relationships are important? If we know relationships is how God moves the kingdom? What do we do when we give people access to our heart, our lives, and they have not become careful and they become irresponsible with that access? They, they, they disrespect us or they abuse that access. I want to answer that question with another question. Have we given those relationships premature? Let me say it better. Have we given those relationships premature access that they have not yet been proven trustworthy in? I'm going to read that question again and read the second one. What do we do when we give people access to our lives and our heart and they're not careful or become irresponsible with that access? They get disrespectful or abuse that access. The second question is, have we given those relationships premature access they have yet to be proven trustworthy in? If you've given somebody access to your life and your heart, that have not gone through the boundaries, have not gone through seasons to prove that they are ready to handle all your heart, then you can't put your trust issues on everybody else and blame them. You have to take some of that ownership for yourself. Because you accelerated a relationship that needed seasons to show you that they were ready for that acceleration. You move relationships out of friendship into other stages of uh, relationships too soon. This is why it's not enough to see if somebody can love me in one season. I need to see how they love me in all seasons. I don't need to just see how you love me when things are going good. I need you to see how you love me when things are going bad. I need to be able to be loved in summer, winter, spring, fall. Because if you can show me that you can love me in a full seasons of time, if you can show me that you can love me in different seasons of my life, then you get more access to me. But if you have not shown me you can love me, again, this is not a wall. This is a boundary. The difference between a wall and a boundary is a wall will block uh, hate from coming in, but it will also block love from coming in. That wall may keep you from being hurt, but it will also keep you from being loved. So I'm setting boundaries, not walls. So have they been trustworthy? Proverbs 20 and 6 says this. Many a man proclaims his own loyalty and goodness, but who can find a trustworthy man or a person. Trustworthy means simply worthy of trust. Tell your neighbor, worthy of trust. Which means I respect you and I love you by faith, but I trust you by proof. You got to understand that. We respect everyone. We love you by faith, but I trust you by evidence. Stacy didn't just say yes when I asked her to marry me because she's just she's going to loan me some trust. I showed her that as a single man, I showed her that as a man who dated her, I showed her that as a man who pursued her, that I was trustworthy. And as I gave her proof that I was trustworthy, we can come into covenant with each other. And it's the same thing with business. It's the same thing in any season of relationships. Someone has to give you evidence that they are trustworthy. And the best way for somebody to show you that they are trustworthy is in adversity. You, you, you know you can trust somebody when they have uh, uh, the opportunity to, to portray you and they don't when they when they have something of a better option and they still stick with you there's different uh, ways that you can use as a barometer but most importantly the best barometer to see if you can trust people is do they keep their word how are they actions I know uh, actions speak louder than words but patterns speak louder than actions what are they patterns not what they do occasionally but what do they do consistently can I get an amen so trustworthy means worthy of trust. In order to have harmony in our relationships, we're going to have to learn how to trust and be trustworthy. Now, for me, my issue was I wasn't a trustworthy person growing up. I wasn't a trustworthy son. I wasn't a trustworthy person until I got about 23 years old and rededicated to my life. So it was hard for me to trust others because I didn't even trust myself. Some of us don't trust people because we know who we are. We know our character. We know our issues. So we don't trust others because we don't feel trustworthy. What if I told you part of you trusting other people is becoming a trustworthy person? Because if you can become a trustworthy person, then you can believe others can be trustworthy. My gosh. So God tells us, check this out. God tells us to trust him and he proves it. He proves it by sending Jesus. To lay down his life in sacrifice. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that way we can trust God. 
God sent Jesus to make a sacrifice for us so as human beings we can say we can trust this God because he so loved us that he sent his son. He sacrificed his son so that way we can have relationship with him. Trust requires sacrifice. Can somebody say amen to that? Now, could it be some of the conflict we're having in our relationships is because we have misplaced expectations. We've shared trustworthy info to people who are not yet qualified to be trusted. I want to share this with you as I'm coming to a close. One of the number one causes of conflict is unfulfilled expectations. One of the number one cause of conflict is unfulfilled expectations. There's a conflict because you had an expectation and it didn't get met. And sometimes those expectations didn't get met because you didn't communicate that it was an expectation. And when you don't communicate an expectation, it gives birth to anger. Anger starts bringing jealousy, envy, passive aggressive, manipulation, strife, gossip. And can I tell you this? You can't have harmony and be hateful. You can't have peace and be petty. Somebody say amen to that. God can't bless hatefulness and God can't bless pettiness. Pettiness tears it apart, but the peace of God keeps us together. Most people don't have the courage to confront things that offends them. So when they don't have the courage to confront things that offends them, they keep covering their wounds of what offended them. And what if I told you cover wounds don't heal well? You keep covering your wounds with a smile. You keep covering your wounds with, nah, I'm good. You keep covering your wounds like, nah, I'm straight, I got it. You keep covering your wounds. And all along while you're covering your wounds, you're hurting on the inside. And when you don't deal with a wound, it starts getting bacteria. It starts, it starts having different issues that's happening to it. And when you don't deal with the wounds of your heart, you'll start getting bitter. You'll start getting hateful. You'll start getting petty. You'll start getting mad. And God is not saying you can't be confrontational in a healthy way. But if we keep hiding what bothers us, we'll never heal what's beneath us. If we keep hiding what bothers us, we won't heal what's beneath us. <laughs> Harmonious relationships takes time. Somebody say it takes time. So what I'm encouraging us today, take the risk to trust again. My gosh. Tell your neighbor, say trust again. Trust again. Now, the thing about trust, you know, I know sometimes we're like, I got discernment. And in my discernment, it's discerning that I can't trust this person. I, ooh, I just see that spirit all over you. <laughs> just something about you is just off. What if I told you discernment is not the gift of suspicion and skepticism? The gift of discernment is to see behind the veil. We use the gift of discernment wrongly. God doesn't want us to discern to be suspicious. He wants us to discern to pray and set better boundaries. My discernment is not to find ways to avoid you. My discernment is to find ways to set a boundary around you so I can still find a way to connect with you. My gosh. Clap for that one. Go ahead. <laughs> Jesus deserves that clap. When we refuse to trust again, as I mentioned earlier, what we're really saying is God is smaller than my pain and my pain is bigger than my God. I'm going to say that again. When we refuse to trust again, what we're really saying is God is smaller than my pain and my pain is bigger than God. My question to us today is, do you really believe he's big enough? Do you really believe that he can heal your heart? Do you really believe that he is the lover of your soul? If you believe that God has a plan for your life, it is not going to be exempt from relationships. And for us to be all of what God has for us to be, it is going to require us to trust again. It's going to require us to have healthy conflict again. It's going to require us to not have the, the discernment that gives suspicion and, and offense. It's the discernment to say, you know what, that part of you, I can't handle, so I'm going to set a boundary, but this part of you, I can't handle, and I'll invite that into my life. It's setting better boundaries. I like what Jesus says in John chapter 14, verses 21. 
The person who has my commands and keeps them is the one who really loves me. And whoever really loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love him and will show, reveal myself to him. I will let myself be clearly seen by him and make myself real to him. In other words, Jesus is saying, what you make important to God, God is gonna make important to him. How do I say this better? God says, I will reveal myself more to you when you make what matters to me matter to you. God is saying, I will reveal more of myself to you when you make what matters to me matter to you. And it's the same thing with people. If God sets a boundary like that, I will reveal more of my heart, more of my life, more of my resources to you when you make what matters to me matters to you. That's how we invite people closer into our life. When you make what matters to me, when you make my values matter, when you make my values of I want to wait till I get married, when you make my values of I like to be respected, when you make my values of, hey, I want you to keep your word, when you start making your values or my values matter to you, you will start mattering to me. And therefore, we start bringing people closer because they respect our boundaries. I like what C.S. Lewis says, when you hide your heart, it may never get broken but it will also become unbreakable, unpenetrable, and unredeemable. I'm gonna say that again. When you hide your heart, it may never get broken, but it will become unbreakable, unpenetrable, and unredeemable. I want to encourage us today that when we set better boundaries, it helps protect our relationship with God, ourself, and others. So what I'm encouraging us today, not necessarily trust them, I'm asking you to trust him and allow him to show you how to trust them. My gosh. I'm asking you to trust him. And when you begin to trust God by spending time with him, when you begin to understand that the integrity of God will make sure that there are people who will love you, people who will not take advantage of you, people who won't mishandle you, but you won't understand that revelation until you start understanding who he is to you. When you understand that God loves you. So I'm asking us to trust him as we trust them. See, what happens is we try to trust them first before we trusted him. And we didn't have a barometer of what love was. We didn't have a barometer of what a healthy family looked like. We didn't have a barometer of what a healthy relationship is. But when we trust God, we get exposed to what it means to have a healthy relationship. And when we don't trust, what we have to understand is the fear of man. Fear of what man can do when I trust them at the root. Let me say it this way. The fear of man is a trap. That's what the Bible says. The fear of man is a trap. So some of us who are afraid to trust again, we're still trapped in addictions. We're still trapped in bad habits. We're still trapped in depression. We're still trapped in despair because God is not going to break you out of that addiction. God is not going to break you out of that despair. God is not going to break you out of that lonely place all by himself with just you and him. He is going to use a person to pull you out of that because he wants to reveal feel that he loves you so when you don't trust nobody you are trapped in your addiction you are trapped in your hurt you are trapped uh, trapped in your bruises and God is saying if you want to get out if you don't want to stay trapped you got to start trusting people again you got to start trusting again God is going to use people to heal you even though Satan tries to use people to hurt you God is going to use people to heal you, even though the enemy tried to use a person to hurt you. And I want to encourage us today that you have to understand that God has the ability to heal you beyond your hurt. Let me say it better this way. You have to know deep down that no one can hurt you beyond God's ability to heal you. Let me say it that way. No one can hurt you above God's ability to heal you. No one can hurt you above God's ability to heal you. No one can hurt you above God's ability to heal you. The completeness of our wholeness determines the vulnerability that we offer. If we're not vulnerable, if we don't communicate our feelings, if we don't share our needs, we won't step into that which God wants to heal us. God has a 
body and that body has hands that body has feet that body is made of people and he is the head and we are the body and he's going to speak to someone to be the hands the feet the mouthpiece the hug the arms to love you God is not going to do things independent of people I know you might think you can get it on your own but God is calling you out of isolation God is calling you out of addiction God is calling you out of that cave of pornography that's been keeping you bound for years and you have been intimate with false things and God wants you to have better intimacy with your wife God wants you to have better intimacy in relationships but you are numbing your pain with false vices and you are trapped in that addiction and I hear the Lord say come out of that right now you don't have to be bound you have a wife you have kids and you have a community who loves you I don't know who that is for but God is saying he wants to heal you stop going to false things to numb your pain God wants to remove that numbing thing God God doesn't want you to use sex he doesn't want you to use drugs he doesn't want you to use wrong vices to heal what only he can heal come out of that trap because that is a trap you've been bound for 20 years your daddy was bound in that your mama was bound in that and you should not allow your kids to be bound in that so I hear the curse breaker saying if you will trust him and not them I will break every trap I will break every addiction I will break every stronghold come out of that right now in the name of Jesus be healed be delivered be set free come out of that right now in the name of Jesus trust is going to start with a try we all need relationships. And I wanna do a call to action real quick in our final moments. Number one, I wanna pray for those who need the courage to trust again. I wanna pray that you are reminded that you are fully resourced in God. And we take risk with everything else. Why not take a risk on something that can give you the greatest reward? I'm willing to take the risk of being stoned by people for the possibility of being healed by Jesus. I'm willing to take the risk of being hurt for being touched by God. We have to understand that people's ability to hurt us is not greater than God's ability to heal us. And I hear the Lord saying, it's time to trust again. It's time to believe that people can love you. It's time to believe that there are good people out there. We can't be so bound up because of what happened in our past. I believe, tr I believe the lack of trust keeps triggering those trauma and I believe God God wants to get you out of that cycle of trauma by trusting again sometimes I believe in therapy I believe in counseling as I've gone and I'm I have a degree in counseling but sometimes a perfectly good friendship sometimes a perfectly convert good conversation sometimes just venting about what you're going through can be therapeutic to where you ain't got to spend hours and time and resources when you have a perfectly good friend a relationship that will see you that will know you and that that will hear you and my second call is the courage to be trustworthy because like me I was more like Judas I had the bad heart and I needed the trust that I could be trustworthy I needed the trust that God will allow people to see me for who I was and you guys know my story when I got out of prison I went to a family and the thing about my family biologically and spiritual family, they saw the me I was becoming and not the me I once was. And it began to heal me. Oh, you trust me like that? Did you know what I used to be? Oh, you trust me with this? Did you know what I used to be? And that trust caused me to live up to that expectation. That trust was a prophetic act of God calling me forward. And I believe that if you've not been trustworthy, God is saying he wants to trust you again. God wants to trust you again. God loves you. He will never give up on you. You are his son. You are his daughter. And God sees the you you're becoming, not the decisions of the past or the mistakes you've made. So if you are here today and you need the courage to trust or you need the courage to become trustworthy, I need you to stand to your feet so I can pray with you and for you. I need you to stand to your feet. We're going to break this cycle of distrust. We're going to break the cycle that keeps us going 
going back to our cave. We're going to break every cycle that's keeping us bound and wound up in things that are not allowing us to experience life and life more abundantly in Jesus' name. And if you see anybody standing next to you, as a family of God, I need you to extend your arm or, or go to them and place your hand on their shoulders. Spirit of the living God, I pray that that person that can't trust anymore, I pray that they will get their eyes off of man right now in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, and place their eyes on you. That although the storms are coming, and although the waves are beating, and although things around them are happening, they will keep their eyes on you. And as they keep their eyes on you, I pray that you give them beauty. I pray that you give them joy. And I pray that you give them praise. Give them the courage to trust again as they set healthy boundaries, as you reveal not through suspicion but through proper boundaries this is a person I can trust I pray they break free from every mirage and every illusion that their isolation their loneliness had told them that they're safe you are not safe in loneliness you are not safe in isolation that is a slow death and God wants you to live he wants you to live and not die he wants you to live in purpose he wants you to live with destiny he wants you to live with abundance of relationships and we call you to life right now we call you to life right now and I pray that right now Lord you're leading people in their lives who they can trust again I pray that where there's parent wounds father wounds mother wounds you'll bring spiritual mothers spiritual fathers to make up the difference Lord where people have hurt them you'll bring people that will heal them and I pray for that person who's like me who wasn't trustworthy I pray father that you would help them to see them as you see them they won't see through the lens of their mistakes they won't see through the lens of their past they they will see the, through the lens of their creator that he left the 99 for the one and God loves you and the fact that you got breath in your lungs the fact that you are breathing today it means he still has a plan for your life and he still sees you as somebody who can be trustworthy so father right now in the name of Jesus I declare that person who doesn't feel trustworthy you are going to uh, you are going to set up opportunities where they can show that they have character they can show that they have integrity and you will trust them again you will trust them again and you will do away with the the wisdom of the world by trusting people who the world says is untrustworthy father you confound or you you do away with the wisdom of the world through the foolishness of God God you would use broken people you would use people who couldn't be trusted at one point to be trusted again to be agents of healing I feel the healer is in the house right now. I feel the healer is in the house right now. He's healing your heart. Yeah, I see that. He's healing your heart. Let those tears flow. Let God bring therapy back to your heart. Let those tears flow. Don't hold that back. Let the Lord begin to minister to you right now. There is a healing bomb in Gilead. God wants to release that healing bomb right now. God wants to release that healing over your mind. He wants to release that healing over that, that trauma that happened in your childhood. God wants to release that healing that might have happened in that divorce. God might, He wants to release that healing that might have happened in that severed relationship. And I speak healing right now in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit. You do what only you can do. You see the hurt, you see the brokenness, you see the imperfection. And I pray that which is out of harmony, you bring into harmony. They are no longer just gonna be a sound. They're gonna be connected to a better sound. They're no longer just gonna be an isolated instrument. But God, they're gonna be a divine instrument in the orchestra of heaven. And God, they're gonna release a sound of love, of hope, of unity, of peace. And I declare that over them right now in the name of Jesus. And if I got anybody in agreement, let's just give God some praise right now.